I'm here. I'm very happy to be interviewing the legendary guitarist, songwriter, manager, uh, writer now, JJ French from Twisted Sister. How are you, JJ? Very well, thanks. And I hope you're okay too. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm very happy. As I said, I'm happy to be chatting with you. I mean, I, I, I follow the band since you guys exploded in Brazil. You know how big Twisted Sister is in Brazil, and, and I'm really happy to be chatting with you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Well, first of all, let's talk about the book. You're just releasing a, a, a new book called Twisted Business, Lessons from My Life in Rock and Roll. 50 years in, uh, of, of uh, rock and roll life. W what are the main, the most important lessons you can share with us from this life? Well, the book um, is a bizwar, which is a phrase that I invented, which is a business book and a memoir because um, I'm a businessman and, th and the music business is, consists of two words, music and business. And most musicians forget the business part of it. But if you forget the business part of it, you may have lost a lot on the music side of it because how many stories are there of, of careers that have gone down the tubes because the musicians themselves were not paying attention to the business that they're in. And it's a very tough business. I mean, all businesses are tough. The music business is extremely tough and it's in the entertainment business and the entertainment business at large is a business about reinvention because it's always about what have you done for me lately? People in the music business and the entertainment business in general deal with this more than just about anybody else. So what the book really is about is a, part of it's a memoir, which is my life story prior to Twisted Sister. And then the challenges of trying to make Twisted Sister succeed and keep it relevant. Um, we're going to enter, I'm going to be celebrating my 49th year in the band um, in December. So uh, it's quite unusual to have a band last that long. In fact, if you think about um, major bands that came out of the 1972, 73 period, you know, you have Kiss, Judas Priest, ACDC, Twisted Sister. Now there's many other bands that came out of it, but you remember those four. We've, we, we all managed to survive and we all probably have crazy stories to tell. Uh, and our story is amongst, I think, the, the most interesting because it really tells you uh, how hard this business is and how difficult it is to sustain a career with all of the unbelievably crazy ups and downs of the career. And, and in the book, I, I structure the book and I, and I create this thing called the twisted method of reinvention. I take every letter, T-W-I-S-T-E-D, and I make a story an example with each letter and what it means, in my opinion, in terms of trying to succeed. So I, I say it's tenacity, wisdom, inspiration, stability, trust, excellence, and discipline. So when you buy this book, you're really getting a business book and you're getting a template and you're getting a guide on how to live your life professionally, regardless of what kind of music you play. In fact, what, regardless of what music, it, whether it's in the music business or not in the music business, it just, gives you a blueprint on how to survive life. Did you, always, did you always have this vision, this professional vision towards the band? I mean, were you the person that had the, these kind of decisions or, or at the time you didn't have that, that kind of discipline as you said on the, on the book? Well, at the end of 1972, when I auditioned for the band that became Twisted Sister, it was called Silver Star, I was just the guitar player. I just signed on to be a guitar player. I had no idea what I was getting into outside of playing guitar in a band. So I was quite happy um, just being the guitar player and letting somebody else make the decisions because I really didn't know. But I think in the back of my mind, uh, I always I have a very strong self-preservation streak. And I think that I decided I was going to learn as much as I could and watch everything I could and and let's see what happens. And if people do their job, that's fine. And if they don't do their job, maybe I'll have to step in. But there was no way to know when I was, the 20 year old JJ is not the 69 year old JJ, okay? 20 year old JJ was just a, a rock and roll kid who wanted to be in a, in, a, in a band and that was it. So it was a very rude awakening and a very long uh, uh, trail to get to where we are now. Well, you're 69. You're looking really good, JJ. I'm, I'm, I'm happy you're looking that good. Uh, anyway, uh, 
what did the the twenty year old uh, kid, you know, guitarist, uh, uh, made like? Do, do you have any any thing that you have made differently? If you could uh, use your exp the experience that you have now, going back to, of course, I'm, I suppose there are, but is there anything that I mean, you guys? have a very unique story uh, after watching the, the, the documentary you guys uh, released a few years ago. It was one of the most in interesting documentaries, uh, music documentaries I've seen. You guys took a while. You have a very unique story, but how did you, how did you manage? Well, I, listen, it, you know, ignorance is bliss. When you don't know, you don't know. So in a, a more interesting question, or observation would be when I was 11 years old and I saw the Beatles on television and I thought that looks like something I want to do. Like, wow, so many people say that. How many musicians my age say, I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan and I said, I want to be that. And, and there's millions of us who say that, okay? And then there's a very tiny group of us that actually did it and even a smaller group of it that actually became successful at it. But I think if um, looking back, I think if somebody put their hand on my shoulder the night I was watching the Beatles on Ed Sullivan and said, okay, wh wh what do you think success means? Uh, I'd say, I don't know, girls and screaming and a gold record. Cause that's what, you know, we all thought gold, oh, gold record, whatever that meant. Oh. So I think, I think if someone had said to me at that moment, okay, you are going to have a gold record, JJ. And I'd say, oh, when? Five years from now? No. 10 years from now? No. 15 years from now? No. When I'm getting this gold record? 20 years and six months from today, I'd go, forget it. I'm staying in school, you know? But I didn't know. So in truth, Stay Hungry went gold 20 years and six months after I saw the Beatles on TV. So... That's one example of not knowing. When the band started in 1973, if someone had said to me, it's gonna be 12 years before you get your first record deal, or 10 years, it was actually 10 years to the first deal. I, I, again, I, don't, I, I think I would have just said no, but you don't know. So you keep going and going and trying and trying and, and, and throwing your head against the wall. And the documentary tells the story of the band trying to get a record deal. And it ends when the band gets a record deal. Doesn't talk about, we're not going to take it and I want to rock or any of that stuff. So that's what makes the documentary interesting. The book goes into really great detail, not only as to how that journey was, but then what happened after. Because so many people said, so where's the second part of the documentary? And I said, read my book. And you will see that... Um, I, I'll put it this way. I have 37 gold and platinum records now as a musician, producer, manager, executive producer, and they're all in a room. And I look at them every day and I go, wow, that's really cool, you know? But if you had shown me a picture of those 37 records when I was 20 and said, what do you think of this? I'd go, I must be the smartest, most famous, richest guy in the world. Instead, I look at it and I go, the price I paid to get that, what I went through to get it, I don't know if it was all worth it because it came with a lot of baggage and a lot of pain. And while it is something that can never be taken away, it's there and it, and it proves that we have made a mark. Um, there was no way to know how hard it was gonna be. And, 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 and how close we came in so many times, whether personally or through the band, we came to the edge where we could have fallen off. And then we fell off, you know, when we fell and we came back and, and it's a pretty crazy, pretty crazy story. And I don't believe it's similar to any other band story because it took so many years just to get the first record deal. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a story of perseverance and it's, uh, I'm glad you did it because we fans can enjoy the music you guys uh, put out. But uh, what caught my attention on the, on the film was the, when you started and 
it was tough for you guys to to play get played on the radio. You actually bought commercial uh, media on the radio stations, and then it proved that you're right. And they are all, all the executives and A and R executives and all those guys. They were wrong, and you were right. So, how did you have that confidence? Oh man, you know. Um... There's a, well, what I say in the book, you know, I use every letter to describe a, a, a meaning, and the W is wisdom, and and whether I, whether by design or by chance, um, that particular episode in which we used our own music in a in a commercial, that was kind of like a smart, you know, that was like a pretty smart idea. You know, we couldn't get. We had independent records and nobody would play them, but you could buy uh, radio commercials to uh, advertise your club appearances in the in the New York area. And uh, especially on weekends and the biggest radio stations, you could buy a minute for uh, $30, $30, $30 a minute. So, so we would buy 131 minute spots and we would put this single shoot them down in the spot. They don't know who it is. They're not ACT, they could care less. They just know that, um, the spot says this weekend Twisted Sisters playing at blah 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 blah, and then you hear this music, and at the end it says Twisted Sisters playing so and so. So if you are listening to that radio station all weekend long, you've got a hundred radio spots where we're playing "Shoot 'Em Down," and all of a sudden you could think we had a hit record on the radio. And of course, you can't do that today, but you could do it back then. So it's another example of you got to use what's in front of you. You can manipulate the media when you can. And that was an example of manipulating the media to our benefit. It's fantastic. It's a subject that's really interesting to me. I worked for 20 years in different record companies and I, I have my own label services company. We have our own label and we offer these kind of services to artists and, and labels everywhere. So I, I love to, to see a parallel of what you guys experienced in the 70s and 80s or until you signed with a major label and 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 the what happens today i mean the the challenge those years were to was to sign with a major company otherwise it was very difficult for you to break today anyone can record an album release an album and distribute it but the challenge is to get exposure more exposure than your competitor so how do you see that parallel and and what is more uh difficult or, or 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 what are the advantages and disadvantages that we have today that's a it's a very good observation and a very good question first of all as you point out the good news is anybody can make a record but the bad news is anybody can make a record and so there's so much out there that how do you rise above the noise you know that becomes the issue now we happen to have two songs we're not going to take it and i want to rock that have raised above the noise to the point where they are standard bearers in the world of popular music in much the same way that um Journeys Don't Stop Believing is just a standard bearer. You know, whether you like them or not, that's not the point. It's a standard bearer song. Um, Queen, We Will Rock You, We Are the Champions. These are standard bearer. These are massive hits that people sing in stadiums. You know, very much the mentality of Europe and South America as it pertains to stadium sounding anthems is one of the reasons why Twisted Sister is successful today. Even though our music is played in American football stadiums and baseball stadiums, uh, it is almost tailor-made for South America and Europe because in South America and Europe in soccer games, everyone puts their arms around each other and they sing these songs. So this is one of the ways that our songs become standards, but also we, we license them for movies and commercials and soundtracks. And you know, in the 60s, counterculture groups Uh, were offended by corporations. We'll never give our music to, to Chevrolet. We'll never give our music to Ford. We're never going to do that because that's beneath us. We're not part of the corporate you know, stuff. Well, nowadays I'm saying, or we're saying anything we can do to get our music out there is important. Any avenue just so happens licensing music is the last bastion of real money in the music industry because it's it's old time money. The way they pay you is just the way they've been paying you for, for the last 30, 40, 50 years. It's not like streaming or anything else. You get real money. So the benefit of it is twofold. One is you get paid a lot. And the other side of it is you get broadcast a lot. So you ask a 10 year old kid, do they know Twisted Sister? 
maybe they don't. You start singing, we're not going to take it. The kid's going to be singing, we're not going to take it. So if our consolation prize is that our music is standardized around the world and young kids know it and it shows up in commercials and TV shows, then you know what? That doesn't suck. Okay. That's a good thing. So that's what we are lucky in possessing. Two between I want to rock and we're not going to take it. Two international anthems that are standardized. Fantastic. Uh, and, and talking about the sound of the band, it's a very unique sound and full of different kinds of influences. And I mean, what, what is the impact of, of growing up in, in, in New York in the 60s, 70s have on, on the sound of Twisted Sister? Because you're a complete crazy mix of, I don't know how many times you saw New York Dolls on CBGBs or mixed with Kiss, but heavier. And how did you create the, the, the unique sound of, of Twisted Sister? The sound of Twisted Sister evolved in the earliest days before D. It was a, a glammy, transvestite dollsy mix of Bowie and Lou Reed and Martha Hoople and the Rolling Stones, you know, and, and believe it or not, we were a copy band. So we had to play Smoke on the Water by Deep Purple and, you know, all the We're an American Band by Grand Funk Railroad because you're a copy band. So you're in the bar. So you're playing a lot of T-Rex and that was happening at the time, you know, so we were very much a product of the time. And then we, then the singer, the original singer, he went and his replacement sounded just like Rod Stewart. So we went through a period of time where we did a bunch of Rod Stewart songs, which most people don't even know about because the guy only lasted two months in the band anyway. But we did soul songs. I mean, we did When a Man Loves a Woman by Percy Sledge, um, Fooled Around and Fell in Love, you know, all this weird stuff that nobody would ever think the Twisted Sister would do. And then he left and then I took over and then I, you know, I brought in a lot of Lou Reed because I don't really have a good voice and you can always do Lou Reed if you don't have a good voice. It's very simple. You know, how do you mess up a Lou Reed song? Sing it on key. You know, you don't have to worry about it, you know, so. Then, <laughs> and, and then and then then my, my agent said, if you really want to become popular again, you need to do Led Zeppelin. And we hired D because D had a great voice. So D comes in and his he was an Alice Cooper fanatic and a Black Sabbath fanatic. <clears throat> and he, you know, I was thinking at that point, maybe we should change the name because the band, we had fallen apart. Like we had really gone down the tubes. And he said, no, let's, you know, I think we should, we should keep it, but we should get crazier. And, and because he was wrapped up in this whole Alice Cooper thing, it just so happened the Rocky Horror movie came out at that time. So we kind of took on a Rocky Horror persona, you know, that kind of shock rock. And Dee started writing these songs, which were kind of Alice Cooper-ish because Alice wrote big anthems like I'm 18, Billion Dollar Babies. You know, Alice wrote big schools out, you know, big anthems. And Dee loved it. So he wrote a song called I'll Never Grow Up Now. And that was one of the first songs he ever wrote. And if you listen to it, this is the beginning of the anthem mentality that Dee had. And then he wrote Bad Boys of Rock and Roll a year later. And that's another anthem you know, growing into the anthem concept in his head. At this point, ACDC is becoming very popular. Judas Priest is becoming very popular. We start covering ACDC and Judas Priest songs. So you get the ACDC piece, shoot them down. You get the Priest section, Run For Your Life and these other songs. These, and all of a sudden, this mix, uh, and Destroyer is Black sabbath -y. So you get this mix of Deep Purple and, and, and Sabbath and, and Alice Cooper, And ACDC all starts, you know, coming together, you know, and then, you know, then he writes, you can't stop rock and roll, which is another anthem song for that album. But of course it reaches the pinnacle in Stay Hungry when he writes, we're not going to take it. But at the time, I don't think I thought that that song was anything other than another extension of his anthems. In fact, The producer didn't like the song and the English record label hated the song and refused to release it as a single, which most people don't even, can't even fathom. But the head of Warner Music in England refused to release the single because he went, that sucks. So it shows you, you know, yeah. how nobody, so, so yeah, it shows you again, right? It's by happenstance and, and, and more than design. 
So here we are now, you know, 36 years later, and we're not going to take it. I want to rock these massive hits where back then, even though the videos made them popular, there was no way to know that those would be the songs. I don't think Queen could have told you in 1975 that we will rock you, we are the champions, are going to become, you know, these massive things. And you know what? They're damn happy they did. Okay. They're very happy they did. So um, we're very happy too. But that's that's how that whole sound thing started coming coming together. Interesting. And and I also I also I always saw that Twisted Sister had like this uh double image. You guys had the, the makeup image and the 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 bad boys image from the you can't stop rock and roll video for example it, it was very interesting as as fans to to see that transformation and i don't know what happened after you know you you of course you after the stay hungry it was a time where the all the bands from la were very famous and twisted sister in my at least in my view went to that direction of the hard rock scene or the sunset strip scene and makeup and everybody was kind of in that same image but but when that uh, stopped i mean being being you know popular when the grunge came and metallica exploded and everything what happened to twisted sister because you could have used your your leather and jeans you know the it, it was it suited the the what the grunge or metallica fans were were into uh why didn't you you guys go into in, in that direction at the time. I don't know if you ever yeah. thought about it. Well, I have thought it's all about in the book. It. And it's all in the <laughs> book. And, and what happened is it's a good, if you asked a very good question, you've asked a question that nobody has asked before. So I, I like that. Um, Thank you. Um, it would have been probably a smart thing to release, come out and play and completely switch over into a harder version of the band and not release um, Leader of the Pack as the first single. Had the band taken a rougher turn and released burning uh, released um fire still burns for example uh it probably would have suited us better but instead we took uh we were under such pressure to reproduce the commercial na nature of it. like in other words if you thought twisted sister was crazy in stay hungry now we're going to be crazier and come out and play and you know and so what i talk about is you know we we rose to the occasion uh, many times and then we made a, a fatal mistake and the fatal mistake was leader of the pack and our fatal mistake was was co-opting the West Coast version of metal because we're not a, a West Coast band. Kiss and Twisted Sister or East Coast bands were very different than the West Coast bands. You know, they're just real differences. There's attitude differences. There's, I mean, look, Gene and Paul are very businesslike. You know, I'm very businesslike. We're like, we, we come from New York. We don't mess around. You know, there's business to be done here. The, you know, we look at California, it's like, dude, 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 like, dude. You know, you go out there, everyone's like, dude, we're partying. Meanwhile, none of us are partying. We're straight. I have no, I'm older than them. I don't want anything to do with it. I think Gene and Paul looked at the same thing. They're straight. They're not going to these parties, you know. They don't want anything to do with that. And not that I'm passing judgment on it. It's just, it's a different culture. Mentally, you, the warrants and the rats and the motleys and the and the poisons. I mean, it was all like to me, it was a cartoon. But then again, I have no right to say someone else is a cartoon <laughs> because we're a cartoon, and Kiss is a cartoon, right? We're kind of like in that weird video goofy rock era. All of us, including David Lee Roth from Van Halen. Like, if it wasn't for Eddie being such a genius. David Lee Roth could be just as goofy and silly as that whole scene, but but we we collapsed in '80s in '87, and the and the grunge scene didn't come in until '89 '90, so we were spared the humiliation of watching our career disappear overnight, like Winger's career disappeared overnight, White Lion's career uh, warrant, they all just kind of got killed. It was like the It was like the meteor that killed, that came down in Mexico and killed the dinosaurs. <laughs> you know, like they were dead. So we were already dead. So, I, you know, I looked at it and went, I even wrote an article for a rock magazine in 1990 called Hair Today, uh, Hair Today Gone Tomorrow about how the fact that all these hair bands are just dead, like in one day, in one freaking day. Ask Kip Winger, he'll tell you. You know, ask Janie Lane, he'll tell you. Ask Vito Brada, he'll tell you. They heard 
smells like teen spirit. And they went, we're done. Goodbye. We're dead. Now, if you would have said to me, so could you predict that 10 years later you would come back? At that point, we had already split up and I had no intention of thinking the band was ever going to come back. I go into detail about that period of the band where we all had jobs. You know, we all had to work. And most people don't think that. They think once you're a star, you're a star forever. And the biggest mistake that successful people make in my business is that they think that stardom is owned and it's not, it's rented. The public lets you rent it for a while. If you're stupid enough to think you own it, you will die. It's that simple. So we kind of understood that. And we all had different jobs. I started working at a pool hall overnight to make money. I was, I, me and D were sued, filed for bankruptcy. And D was a, answered phones at a recording studio <laughs> for a producer, Rick Wake. I worked at pool hall. I sold stereo equipment. I got remarried. I got divorced. I got remarried. For me, but then two things happened with D. Number one, he wrote a hit single for Celine Dion. Yeah, he told Christmas you that song. Once. That was huge. And I produced Seven Dust with Mendoza, and that was huge. So those two things sustained us. But we still, me and D were not talking. We didn't talk for, you know, 10 years. And as I detail in the book, we had a we had a, um, a reconciliation meeting in my house, and that meeting took place twenty years to the day that I hired D to be in Twisted Sister. So that I hired him in February of seventy six. On February of ninety six, we had a reconciliation meeting, not to put the band back together, just to uh, fix our relationship because it had been damaged. And I didn't want to go for the rest of my life hating somebody. I'm not of that. It's too much energy. And, and he agreed. And we had a really good talk. And then I said, okay, well, well there's no band, but at least we, we're fine. We're cool, right? We're all cool. Shake hands. Have a nice life. I had just had a, a kid. He had his fourth child. Have a good life. And then because of a series of events like 9-11, which altered the world for many of us, you know, the band got back together to do a benefit. Now, at that time, there was no way of knowing that the band's uh, legend lived on around the world. We had no idea, none. And we're smart guys, but we had no idea because the whole scene had just collapsed. But because we collapsed as a perfectly um, maintained cadaver, in other words, like, you know, if you could somehow resuscitate it, you'd get the same thing as opposed to a group that comes back with not the original guy, not the original guy, the cousin or the brother, or the roadies, uncle so when the opportunity came back we could we could say hey the band really is back because you really want to give your fans what they want which is the reality of the band not a fake cover version of your band so we all were able to come back and and if we didn't come back we wouldn't have played south america and i have to tell you something um many times you you can say these things and it sounds fake but i will tell you if we never came back. I, I never had the opportunity to play South America. I never would have understood what the band's impact was. I mean, yes, in Europe, we, we, we headlined all those gigantic festivals and you know we came back bigger than ever. But my God, the religious fervor of South American fans, it doesn't matter what country it's in, Mexico, Brazil, Chile, Argentina, uh, um, Bolivia, it's like a religion. It's mind blowing. And if you don't experience it, you will never know what true adulation is. You know, the Beatles were 22 years old and they had all these girls screaming. And, you know, frankly, in heavy metal, you know, you have your fans screaming, but it's not like girls like scream. In South America, you have young people coming to the shows, not like in, a, in, a, not like in the US where you tour now and there's 50 year olds, 60 year olds, 70 year olds. You go to South America and the kids are 15 and 20 and they're all wearing. Judas Priest, ACDC, Black Sabbath, Kiss, Patches everywhere, and they live for it. And it's one, it was one of the greatest experiences of my life. I mean, playing Sao Paulo for the first time was unbelievable. It was absolutely unbelievable. So, uh, you know, Paolo, our, our promoter, brought us down there, and uh, we played Curitiba. Yeah, Paolo Baron, he's a good friend. Paolo Baron, yeah, and he, and come on. He's like one of the greatest guys in the world. You know, he brought us down there and he said, yeah, yeah, you're not going to believe 
The people they go to go crazy, man. You know, like yeah, yeah, it was good, yeah, 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 yeah. Let me tell you, <laughs> and 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 he was right, you know. And then we get to Argentina, we played, you know, oh my God, you know, Buenos Aires. They went nuts, and we played Chile, and they went nuts, and then we played in Bolivia where I couldn't breathe because there's no air up there, and, <laughs> and soccer stadiums. Anyway, the fans are unbelievable. Why do you think that? Why do you, why is, what is, what is the, what is that emotional part of, of South America, of Hispanic fans that, that, that make them like that? Can you tell me? Well, uh, you know, we have the, the Latin blood in our veins, but uh, in, in Twister Sister case, it's, uh, it's a love affair that, that uh, had to wait, I don't know how long, since stay hungry till till you guys came for the first time it was what 25 years, years? Yeah, 30 yeah. years so yeah. it was a, a lot of uh anxiety or or uh, anticipation. anticipation anticipation for yeah. for the concert and when you came it was like i i had to say i i missed that show i was out out of the country in that specific the first show you're you're mentioning i was on the second one when you came back it was fantastic as well but i always think of that first show as i i have that stain in my in my life i haven't i missed that one but anyway yeah, I, I, i'm yeah. sorry i'm exceeding the time here but it's it's such, so nice to be chatting with you i want to know why doesn't the band release new material i, I already asked d about that when i interviewed him but i want to i wanted to hear from from you i understand that you know the fans are always waiting for the new songs to go to buy beer or 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 anything like that but it's i suppose for a musician it would it's always exciting to to create new new material no well for d it is i mean he he does it on his own solo record you know and and so whatever his reasons are for for either not doing it or doing it, it's his reasons I, I i it i don't know i think everyone thinks well just because you're a musician this is what you want to do for the rest of your life and you can't wait to do something new And it, it doesn't apply to me. I, I, don't, I never liked the studio to begin with. I never enjoyed that part. I thought I would, but I never liked it. So, you know, we did the Christmas record and that was very successful. That was a really great idea. We were very focused in on that. And that was a great record and that was new. And we re-recorded Stay Hungry and then we put in eight more songs on that. So that was new. But the truth is when you play for the fans, if, if you were to, If, 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 if a big sign went up um, at a concert and you said, tonight Twisted Sisters is going to play these 17 songs and these are all the 17 songs you want to hear. So, but they have a new record out and they'll play five new songs and we have to take five out of this list. Which would you take out? And they wouldn't take out one song, okay? I mean, that's the truth. So um, you could think they want to hear it, but they have no interest in hearing it. They really don't. They want to hear what they heard for the first four albums. And that's just the truth. I mean, it doesn't mean that they're right and they're and, and nobody wants to hear new stuff. But what it means is when you spend your hard-earned money and you're going to see what is considered a legend in your mind, and you have these records that have been fed you for 20, 30, 40 years, you want to hear those songs. So when heritage bands like Twisted make a new record, they first, it's, it's pretty funny, The first week, they're playing five new songs from the, from the new album. The second week of their tour, they're playing four new songs on their new album. The third week of their tour, they're playing three new songs. By the first month of their, new, of their tour, they've just thrown it all out the window or one song, and they are praying to get through it because you want to play what the fans want to hear. And that's just what you want to do. So if you're there to make a fan happy, really happy, and you know that they want all those songs, then you play those songs for them. And if you're an entertainer, that's your responsibility. I, I happen to believe in the responsibility of an entertainer to his audience, to their audience. You have to give, a, you have to give them what they want. 95% of them want that, okay? So there may be a tiny percentage that want a new one here and there, but 95% of them want that. And our job is to give you that and to give it to you the best way we can so that you leave and tell your friends, How could you have missed that show? That was the best show I've ever seen. And they all do. 
because that's how we headlined all those gigantic festivals. Think about this. How many bands in this world can a promoter trust with 100,000 people? 10 bands, 20 bands, maybe, maybe, maybe. We're one of those bands. Promoter goes, yeah, Twist is a, they'll close a show, 100,000 people. Now the promoter has millions of dollars invested in that show, right? Millions. And not only in that show, but in his festival. And he has to make sure the fan walks out and goes, that was the best damn festival in the world. If one of those headliners suck, that's not gonna be too good. So he hires Iron Maiden, because they'll do Iron Maiden, or he hires Judas Priest, or he hires Kiss, he hires Guns N' Roses, he hires Twisted Sister. Why? Because we give 100,000 people a communic, a, 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 what is it, a, a performance that bonds them as a community. So the last show we did was in Mexico with Kiss. And it started to rain at the end of our set. So we played to the 40,000 people and then it started raining and half of them left and, and only Kiss played to maybe 20,000 of them. But we had 40,000 and, and it was our last show and everybody knew it. And it was like being in a church. I can get very emotional about the last show because as much as I wanted it to be the last show, it was in Mexico, it was in South America, it was that religious connection, which doesn't exist anywhere else that way. Not to say the fans in Germany and Sweden and Finland are not great, because they're great, but there is that thing, I can't explain it, or I did, it's more religious than anything else in a way, it's spiritually connected, and you could just tell, you know, you could just tell. And that experience, if you don't, if you don't have this in their chain, you will never know. It's one of the greatest experiences that any human being could ever feel. And what can we, last question? What can we expect uh, for the future? Any any possibility of of shows again or tours or? We all had dinner about a year ago, and we never brought it up. <laughs> so I mean, it never even came up as a question. We just had dinner with our families, our wives, you know, we were together, never came up as a question. Just always said, pass the steak. Um, I'll have this, you know, that was it. And, and so there's, will there be projects? There'll be pack repackaging of stuff. If I can find tracks that I haven't found before, remixes, we'll do that. You know, obviously D has his thing. He's doing his solo thing and he's got his hot sauce. Mark Mendoza has a has a show called Area 22. You can he interviews people. I have my podcast, the JJ French Connection, J A Y J A Y F R E N C H, the JJ French Connection. It's on Apple and Spotify, everywhere you get podcasts. I'm having fun with that. And and this is this is the story. So this is what I'm promoting is, is the book, and that's that's what it is. And and but I will say this: you don't know. Nobody knows. No one, we, we swore we would never get together again after 1988 and we got together again. So I will not say that it won't happen again, but I don't foresee it happening again, at least in the, in the near term. So um, the, we're, I'm dedicating myself to this, to this right now and being on shows like yours and, and also having the opportunity to thank our fans around the world and let them know how much it really meant emotionally to us for them to be there thank you so much mr jj french uh, it was great chatting with you having you on wiki metal happy hour twisted business lessons from my life in rock and roll the book is already out i i can maybe try to get you in touch with some brazilian publishers to to have it done in portuguese in the meanwhile i'll get my copy in english and and i, I i'm really curious to know all the secrets all the lessons you can share okay. with us. Thank well, you for the generosity, man. It's on Amazon, of course. Uh, but you can the Rosetta is the book publisher. So if if you if if any if you can do anything with that, that'd be wonderful. Thank you so much for your support and Thank take you, care. Man. Bye bye. Long live Twisted Sister. Long live JJ French. Take care. Take care.